Welcome and good morning or good afternoon, uh, wherever you might happen to be. Um, welcome to What Science and Technology Owe the National Defense, an event brought to you by Future Tense and Issues in Science and Technology. Future Tense is a partnership between Arizona State University, New America, and Slate Magazine. And Issues in Science and Technology is our cousin. It's a publication of the National Academy of Sciences, uh, which is very much on point for the conversation we're gonna have today. Um, I'm thrilled to have with us um, Jamie Holmes, who is a Future Tense Fellow and the author of, I have to do the plug here, 12 Seconds of Silence, How a Team of Inventors, Tinkers, and Spies Took Down a Nazi Super Weapon. And that is the, the inspirational, the inspiration that the trigger, uh, I won't say the fuse for today's event. Um, in addition to Jamie, I am pleased to have with us uh, Margaret O'Mara, who is the Howard and Francis Keller Endowed Professor of History at the University of Washington, and the author of The Code, Silicon Valley and the Remaking of America. Hi, Margaret. And uh, my Arizona State University colleague, um, retired Lieutenant General Robert Schmidl, who is the University Advisor on Cyber Command I'm sorry, on cyber capabilities and conflict studies at ASU, having been the former first deputy commander of United States Cyber Command. Um, so welcome everyone. My name is Andres Martinez. I am the editorial director of Future Tense. I also am a, a, a professor at our Cronkite School of Journalism. And I'm, I'm, I'm very excited. Um, I, I loved your book, Jamie. And yeah. it's, it's, it's a great tale of how uh, a number of, of very idiosyncratic, quirky, interesting scientists, tinkers, technologists came together during the war um, and then created what became the Office of Sci Scientific Research and Development um, and how they played a, an important part in, in this conflict. And one of the things that, Jamie, that your, your book mentions at the outset is that World War II was a conflict that was ultimately determined by weapons that were, were you know, almost unfathomable or were not really uh, you know, in play at the outset of the conflict. And that's one of the things that makes World War II very distinctive. And oftentimes we immediately, our minds immediately go to the Manhattan Project and you know, the advent of the atomic age at, as that being a decisive factor in the war, obviously. But I think what is really great about your book is that it tells the story of the, the scientists being deployed for all sorts of other, um, to meet other challenges and particularly the defensive challenge of, I mean, I, I didn't realize until I read your book that anti-aircraft guns in London during the Blitz were, were mostly there for show, <laughs> that it was, it was for morale because uh, they weren't very effective. And the big challenge was how, you know, creating the first smart weapon that, that you know, where you could try to bring down those, those bombers and ultimately the drones that the Germans were, were sending over, over the UK. Um, a, a, as a defensive measure. So I, uh, I love talking to you, Jamie, about your book. And I think one of the things that was very intriguing about this in terms of um, what we at Future Tense and issues in science and technology grapple with is this ecosystem that we have between uh, you know, military, uh, the academy, and industry, um, you know, the military industrial slash knowledge um, complex, whatever we want to call it, that is what provides a lot of innovation to American technology. It's what keeps us safe. And obviously, there's a lot of friction there. Um, so it's a great topic that, you know, this is sort of the origin story. You talk at the end of your book about how Vannevar Bush's Office of Scientific Research and Development was dissolved as planned in 1947, but the military industrial complex rose directly from its ashes. So I'm very excited to explore your book and then have this conversation with the three of you to, to have a conversation about how we got from there to today, how things have evolved. And I can't think of a more masterful conductor of that conversation than my colleague, General Schmidl, who has done everything from commanding F-18 squadrons to being on the um, board of the Defense Science, um, being a member of the Defense Science Board and just operating in this, in this br bridging these three worlds and being engaging with this complex of how do we leverage technology and science for national 
defense. So I'm really thrilled to, to pass the baton to you, General Schmidl. To our audience members, as you have questions, um, you can. there's a Q&A functionality in the Zoom webinar. I, I'm going to keep an eye on those. And then at, at a certain point in the conversation, we'll, we'll pivot to some of those. But for now, um, General, the conversation's all yours. Thank you. Thanks, Jamie. Uh, so if I could, let me echo what uh, Jamie said, or what uh, uh, Andreas said about Jamie's book. I thoroughly enjoyed it as well. Uh, so Jamie, let's start off at the, at the beginning, it, talking about your book. Can you give me, uh, you mentioned very early on that your book is about how science moved to the core of military strategy. And, and I think that what is different about, um, uh, about the story that you tell about World War II is there was a connection between the technology that was being developed and the implementation, uh, uh, the way that it was actually implemented and then the way that it, that it affected uh, military strategy, operational strategy. Could you talk a little bit about that, about how you came to that, uh, to that realization uh, from a lot of the, 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 you know, the more tactical stories that you told in there, but you've obviously got your eye on the bigger picture about how, the, the, how science actually uh, altered changed, influenced in a very big way, the strategy of the, of the military. Uh, so thank you very much. Um, I apologize there's a jackhammer outside my apartment, so I'll be trying to mute, mute that. Um, thank you to New America, and thank you so much to the uh, National Academy of Sciences, and thank you for the question. Um, I didn't begin imagining that I would devote so much of the book to um, this sort of political question. Which you're, um, which you're addressing, as, as to, you know, so Vannevar Bush, who is one of the main uh, historical figures in the book and then becomes very important later on in, in, to our broader question, is interested in recruiting scientists to the war effort. And I thought I would tell a bit of his story and a bit of the story of this smart weapon. And what I really got drawn into was how he managed um, sort of the bureaucratic and political fights that he got into, particularly with uh, Admiral Ernest King, the commander of the Navy fleet. And, and the question, you know, there's the technical obstacles of making new weapons and medicines. And then there's this very interesting larger story, which I felt the book would not be complete uh, without, of how you put these weapons and, uh, into the field. And that caused political problems. So on two occasions, uh, prominently, uh, Bush clashes with King on uh, what role scientists should play in actually uh, putting weapons into the field and even military strategy. Uh, there's a case in the Battle of the Atlantic where we've developed airborne radar and Admiral King favors convoy tactics uh, to protect the convoys to England. And uh, Bush believes that the airborne radar has advanced significantly enough that we can hunt these German U-boats from the air um, and has a, a fight with King about this. And then later uh, lobbies Roosevelt to form a joint committee on new weapons in which the idea is that scientists are going to be advising joint chiefs, um, not just on what the weapons can do, but what are the potential strategic um, uh, uses of new weapons. So throughout the story, and I'm sure throughout our discussion, you have these interesting administrative bureaucratic clashes. Um, I think that I saw, you know, we're talking about industry, academia, uh, government, science, military, and it's really at the core of, I suspect, um, our discussion is going to be how do you organize these elements together uh, for benefits and what are the, um, uh, what are the outcomes of different types of organization uh, and different liaison between these groups and how they have different cultures and these cultures run into each other uh, and how you solve the problems that arise from those uh, conflicts. So if I could follow up on that for a minute, Jamie. So based on the, the analysis that you did and the, and the case that you presented in your book, what would you recommend today let's just say that the future secretary of defense uh gave you a phone call said come into the office and tell me what should i do 
how how do what are, I mean without getting into the weeds? What are the big thematic things that you could recommend based on what you've seen? You mentioned King, and um, and and Bush, and what I took away from that was, and having been lived through the innovation and bureaucracy piece when I was with the Marine Corps Warfighting Lab, there's, you just can't ever underestimate the, the, the power of entrenched bureaucratic thinking. So uh, based on what, what would you tell a future Secretary of Defense, how, how can I do this? How can I do, how can I make this organization more agile, more innovative? Uh, so I think to step back, I mean, one of the themes that is certainly present from the onset of this organization in 1940 and becomes a key part of the debate as to what science and technology owes the national defense is to what is the role of um, uh, basic research and what is the role of scientists in that basic research and to what degree do they have uh, autonomy and discretion over choosing what they should do. I mean, the way that the Office of Scientific Research and Development was set up was, um, we can go into it, but basically um, it's dispersed contracts to private and public universities. They're gonna do the research at those laboratories or industrial laboratories, but it's going to be directed by military goals. Uh, so the military is gonna say broadly, we want better armor and you figure out how to do it and one of Bush's main emphases was that in order to come up with radical new innovations, you need a lot of basic research. Uh, so we're going to go back to the beginning. We're going to say, instead of saying, how can we improve, let's say, this tank armor, we're going to see, what, are there other materials that we can use? We're going to ask fundamental questions. And that's going to allow us to come up with radical new innovations. Um, and, and Bush believed and scientists believed that there were enough breakthroughs, scientific breakthroughs in the 30s that hadn't been harnessed and that they felt the existing Army and Navy research laboratories were not going to be able to uh, 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 handle. Um, so a heavy emphasis on basic research, independence, decentralization. Um, and then after the war, the question becomes when the Office of Scientific Research Development sort of becomes um, the National Science Foundation, the question is to, well, to what degree are the scientists gonna have autonomy in uh, picking what research they're gonna do? So to me, this is kind of the fundamental question. Like you, you, can, you, can, ha you can have uh, leveraging existing technologies that are being developed independently. And what does that pathway look like? And then you can have the model in World War II, which is you're, you're having scientists which are given directives and it's much more focused and controlled. Um, so that's, I don't know, that's maybe a beginning of, of a discussion. Okay. Um, so the, the, the next question that I have, and, and Margaret, if you could, I'd like, to, like you to respond to this. Um, today in the Department of Defense, we are spending, we, the Department of Defense, is spending far, far less on research and development for military applications uh, by orders of magnitude than we were in the 1980s, in the early 1980s, late 1970s. More and more of the, of the research and development, which is now kind of that fine line between basic research and applied uh, uh, research is being done by the commercial sector. And more and more you hear conversations in DOD about leveraging commercial technology and what they're creating. So Margaret, in, in your book, when you talk about the development of Silicon Valley, you know, one of the, one of the more interesting parts of all that, and one that I was not as aware of, is the extent to which the U.S. government fueled the growth of Silicon Valley. And, and, and that was before people became, uh, shall we say, some people became uneasy about the kinds of things that the government was asking them to do. So, Margaret, if you could, how do we balance this commercial uh, research and development, whether it's basic research or applied, with the needs of the, of the U.S. Uh, Department of Defense, and, and specifically, examples from what you talked about in, in Silicon Valley and its growth, which is very much, although initially maybe fueled by government expenditures, 
clearly the examples that you give at the end with Apple and Jobs and others are more commercial applications that now the U.S. military is trying to figure out how to how to modify potentially and use them. Can you uh, give us your your perspective on that? Yeah. Well, the, the, the process that Jamie writes about in his book during the war is uh, quite literally Bush was the father of the father of Silicon Valley, or maybe not yeah. literally, but his, um, uh, that, that this, this whole structure has an after, a Cold War afterlife becomes the model for the military industrial complex to come. And you're right, this, this, um, this entire, you know, the, the beginning, why is, why is the industry in the Santa Clara Valley of California, which was an agricultural valley up until then? It's because of the small electronics that was, um, uh, that was def almost entirely defense related. That's the, and, and all of the investment that the U.S. government is, and the Defense Department is making in electronics, large and small, but particularly in the case of Northern California, this part of Northern California, small electronics. And, um, and where, where you see the, the genealogy from the, the wartime effort and what goes on a decade plus later in, the, in Silicon Valley is that the graduate advisee, the PhD um, advisee of Vannevar Bush from MIT is Fred Terman, who becomes the Dean of Engineering and Provost of Stanford, who really is um, a, has a major role in reorganizing Stanford University's entire apparatus to build up physics, to build up its electronics laboratories, and to create this incredible incubator and train and a place a training ground for for technologists. And there's a hidden history there that um, is really important in understanding today's relationship. You know, um, what what is the relationship of industry that what we're dealing with right now and the relationship between the Pentagon and tech is just the latest phase in a long ongoing relationship that's taken many different forms. And it's often been hard to see. I like to tell the story of Fairchild Semiconductor, which is the kind of the, the original startup. This is, this is the, the original silicon semiconductor um, startup whose co-founders included the people who went on to look to the founders of Intel, other semiconductor companies of Kleiner Perkins, which is a major venture capital firm in the Valley that has been behind just one blockbuster after another, generation after another. This company, which is kind of put up as a model of this is this was the beginning of the, the Silicon Valley startup entrepreneurial story. Its book of business in the first years of existence was majority governmental and majority defense. And that's something that's not because that's where the business was, you know, no one else is buying integrated circuits <laughs> other than other than the government. Um, and and so the, you know, recognizing this interrelationship, I think you know, and recognizing there are things that only government can and should do. Um, and sort of picking up on your last question to Jamie, kind of what comes next, you know, look, the, we, the, the U.S. built this extraordinary structure of, of scientific research and technological capacity within the government um, that worked hand in hand with industry, um, but also was kind of setting the agenda. Not And, and I think that what we need to understand is that industry is, you know, an important partner to to different parts of the government. Not it can't be the agenda setter. These are publicly traded for profit companies. They've got, you know, their 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 priorities are necessarily different. So how can we reinvest and empower the, you know, this structure that's there rather than reinvent something entirely new? But to think about what sort of capacity can we build up within the government to be a real viable partner and an agenda setter that's working in partnership once again. That's great. Uh, that's that's a, a great overview. So let me ask the two of you a question here that, that uh, your comments, uh, uh, Margaret, I think we're pointing toward. So if the, if the trend continues and the U.S. government continues to rely more on commercial research and development, and potentially on universities to do basic research. How do we deal with the issues of intellectual property as we, as we start to try to figure out what we can transition from the commercial sector into, um, into whether it's defense or other government work? I mean, we've had uh, numerous back and forths between some of the iPhone manufacturers, shall we say, and the FBI and others about privacy and about access. So as we, as the line, it appears to me, the line is much more blurred now than it might have been 
when Jamie was in the time Jamie was writing about about the distinction between government or military applications and commercial applications. Now, we didn't have proximity fuses, didn't have a, a big commercial application in the 1940s, although the use of that kind of RF energy uh, to determine proximity to a target is something that is going to have some applicability later on down the road as we learn more and more about RF, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so how, how do we how do we potentially either transition what the commercial sector is creating or influence the creation of some of those capabilities that are clearly dual use? Uh, and I know that there's been some activity out in the Silicon Valley in this Silicon Valley Defense Working Group that I'm associated with, looking at dual use technology startups as, a, as potentially a wave of the future. Could uh, either or the two of you give me some thoughts on where you think you see that uh, particular trend going? Well, I'm not sure I would, I would talk about the, the tr where it was going. I, I could talk about how difficult a problem it is. Uh, and certainly Vanny Verbush foresaw what your question as a central problem. They arranged it so that the patents would be owned by the government because okay. they foresaw that you're going to have a lot of messy legal fights after the war, which other countries did and America didn't. Bush had a personal interest in patent law, so he saw this early on. Uh, and he also arranged so that there would be no profits based on any research done in industrial labs or the, or the university labs. Hmm. Um, and additionally, I mean, it was such a period of, of patri patriotic solidarity, uh, you know, companies shared designs with each other. And scientists would just say, like, sorry, we're going to share your design with your rival company. There's nothing you can do about it. Uh, so. You know, I, I can't imagine the kind of obstacles or the various obstacles that you're implying that if you didn't have those safeguards and protections in place. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and I mean, it's a really, it's a really central question. Um, and, and the, you know, I think one of the ways to think about it, though, too, is that what is, you know, what makes, um, what are the components of a tech ecosystem? You know, why, why has the United States, uh, you know, been able to produce the technologies, both military and civilian, um, commercial and governmental and academic since, you know, since the 1940s? It's not just a matter of the technology itself. It's also a matter of the of the the people and the and you know one of the things I point out often about you know um, tech transfer, which is the sort of process through which the, the, the inventions that are conceived of and, and developed in university labs are can be commercialized. And um, since the since the war, since the early Cold War and and from the particularly from the 1980s forward, after the Bay Dole Act allowed ease, more ease of commercialization of, of research that was originally funded with government grants, um, there's been a lot of emphasis on this sort of spin-off activity. A lot of that has come from the biotech side, the biomedical side, less from the IT side. And on the IT side, it's actually, you know, what, Stan what has been the most important product that Stanford has spun off? It hasn't been tech, it's been people. Um, and I think the same goes for MIT and the same goes for other institutions. I mean, yes, there are these really important pat patents, really important IP, but there's also this, I think, another dimension of this sort of question of what's the relationship between government or what's the relationship between the, the public sector and the private sector, the commercial sector is thinking about who's building it and how those two sectors are working together. And, 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 I, and I do, you know, I think one of the tricky things that makes it challenging is, you know, look, the, and we saw this very recently at, or in the last few years with the employee pushback that in these large tech companies to the big defense, the defense contracts that companies like Google and Amazon and Microsoft have been, that are now, you know, very engaged in and employees saying that's, we don't want to work with the Pentagon. That's not us. That's not what we do. And, then you have people like me and Jamie saying, oh, oh, but, but, but actually, <laughs> you know, this is, this is the history, this is intertwined. Um, and I think recognizing that sort of being frank about, okay, why did the U.S. spend all this money on advanced science and, and, and technology in the 50s and 60s? Why were scientists advising Eisenhower and other presidents? Because of the Cold War, it was war, it was geopolitical imperative, you know, that is, that prompted the U.S. to spend a lot of money on things. And, um, and that business of war, 
had a lot of, you know, was the foundation for this extraordinary set of commercial technologies and technologies that have had wide application, you know, GPS, for example, you know, things that kind of come out of this Cold War defense complex. The space program was a Cold War program. You know, why were we shooting the moon? Because we didn't want the Soviets to get there first. Yeah. So kind of, I think there's a, I think these, this question of, and, and I, and, and, and Bob, you really get to the heart of, I mean, one of the real sort of thorny questions is the question of, you know, back doors and encryption and national security. And that's something that's been a live question for a really long time. You know, the, the, the U.S. law enforcement and national security agencies want to be able to have a way in to see these American made hardware and software products, you know, use those, um, not let, not let, bad actors use those um, in ways that, that can't be tracked. And I don't think that's going to go away. Jamie's entirely right. If this were an easy problem to solve, it would have been solved already. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. So, um, so let me pick up on that just for a second. And two things that you just mentioned, one of them was this, this imperative that the business of war of the cold war was one of the reasons why science had, had risen to such a, a, a level of visibility, if you will, among the senior politicals in the country. There are those that would uh, that would suggest that today we are entering into another existential um, competition with China that is not solely military, but that is technical, is economic, et cetera, et cetera. And as we look at how the United States is postured to deal with that, it would seem to me that, uh, again, picking up on something that uh, Jamie mentioned in his book about the relationship between Bush and Admiral King, it, it's not just the scientific content, that it's not just the science itself. And we see this now in all manner of things we're dealing with COVID related. The science is a part of it, but the execution of being able to execute inside of bureaucracies that have, uh, in some cases, very tribal structures, that finding a way to do that. And Bush did. He eventually went around King to, to Roosevelt, convinced Roosevelt, and Roosevelt came down on top of him and said, no, we need to do this. Anybody on the outside looking in would have said, you're kidding me, right? I mean, you can detect these periscopes of these submarines and the, and the conning tower. Why would I not use that? But there's an embedded way of doing that. So I guess what I would, what I would, uh, would ask the two of you to respond to is the first question from the research that you've done separately in these books, what did you, conclusions did you come to about innovation in bureaucratic organizations, about how to move forward uh, in some cases in the Valley from nothing and then having to deal with the companies as they created their own bureaucracies. And Jamie, in, in your book here about how they was, was literally trying to break those silos that he encountered in trying to get to be more uh, innovative. If you could uh, maybe give us some insight into that as that might be useful as we think about the competition that we are having today with uh, other countries that goes beyond just military uh, means, if you will. Jamie? Uh, sure. Uh, and then I want to ask you a question, Margaret. Um, yeah, I think, you know, as your first question alluded to, it really is an organizational story and an organizational triumph. Um, and you have these connections with people who aren't used to talking with each other. Uh, you've got the scientists and the military, and one of the funny stories that I tell in the book is that one of the characters who created this smart web in Merle II, he starts swearing a lot because he's, yeah. he's trying to <laughs> sort of blend, blend in, and he, then he stops swearing completely after the war. He never, so that's, you have these, these um, you know, profession, groups with different professional cultural backgrounds, and you need this strong uh, liaison between the military and the scientists, and that was facilitated uh, in the book by this uh, sort of brilliant Navy guy named Deke Parsons. Um, and then you have to have the scientists and the industrial partners. And, you know, at one point uh, in making the smart web and the, the head of the program sends someone to live with the, with the industrial liaison and he lives at his apartment. <laughs> um, so I think that, um, you know, they were very aware of how these human um, connections across these sort of different cultural backgrounds professionally were going to be the core of success. And when 
there was an analysis of why Germany was unable to build this uh, smart weapon. It was for the very reasons uh, that we're discussing. There's a, there's a report in 1945 where uh, they say that the Germans had, quote, too little liaison between laboratory and factory and between technician and military, practically no employment of pure scientists. They're not doing uh, basic research, not enough basic research. Dispersal of effort in too many directions, dissent, distrust, and little sense that the country's war needs were primary. Uh, and another report concludes that apart from their aeronautics research, the Germans failed miserably in availing themselves of their scientific, uh, we'll say, uh, brain power. Uh, so I think it really, it really is um, about these, um, these organizational uh, connections between these different groups. Amy, did you want to ask Margaret a question before she responds? I did, sure, I, I, but I don't want to change the topic if you had a response to that question, Margaret. Well, I think, I think you're exactly right. And I, I think, you know, when we look at, you know, where does innovation happen within bureaucratic organizations, which, you know, to be clear, can be both public, private, and private sector and academic, you know, all sectors have bureaucracies. And, and one can argue that, you know, in the tech sector now dominated by five extremely large companies, um, which, you know, I think it's a constant struggle to keep their kind of innovative, you know, soul mm -hmm. <laughs> when you're within a very large company. But what's the real distinction? Where do we see these breakouts? It's leadership. And I think the, you know, the example of Bush going all the way up to Franklin Roosevelt, who's like, yep, this is what we're doing. Um, and um, you know, leadership can, can cut a lot of ways. It can, it can be leadership for good or for bad. But I, I think a great example is that of um, the internet itself, right? Which comes out of DARPA, the Advanced, Ans Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, um, and is the product of, you know, a, a couple of people pushing through, you know, convincing the, the, their military bosses to allocate a million dollars to create this academic computer network that's mm -hmm. connecting these, you know, these folks who have these different, you know, um, government grants to, so they, their computers can communicate with one another. And then there is the beginning of, you know, 1969 of what the ARPANET that becomes the internet that becomes mm -hmm. everything. And, and that is the, you know, there we have leaders within a bureaucracy um, and DARPA is a great example and continues to be a, you know, as you all know, and I'm sure many people on the line know, a really critical, critical um, funder of a truly advanced research or blue sky research, the one that becomes even more important as time goes on as funding in other parts of, of the discretionary budget go down. The Pentagon's budget's pretty pretty okay, even in the 80s and 90s as the rest of the US um, discretionary spending is more, you know, it's harder to hold on to um, the same levels of spending for the NSF and, and, other, and other research agencies. And, uh, and that's, you know, leadership is a big deal. It, it makes a big, it's a big deal who's in those, within those organizations, large and small, who are pushing and making something happen. So before, Jamie, before I jump to that question, so real quick, so one of the issues with the budget in the Pentagon, and, and unfortunately, I have a, a, a great deal of experience with that. <laughs> the, um, as the, the amount of uh, the percentage of growth every year in personnel costs far exceeds anything that we spend on science and technology. And when we budget in the Pentagon, we budget for inflation, right? And a couple of percent a year. But, the, but at the end of the day, in really gross numbers, if the Pentagon doesn't get 10% a year of a budgetary increase, it's a net loss. And when the net loss comes about, unfortunately, one of the first things that people look at to start trimming money from is science and technology, is the S&T budget. And the money tends to go into programs. What are we building? Can I, can I buy another ship? I don't care if it's manned or not. I don't care how big it is. The Navy's got to get to 355 one way or another. So we're buying ships, we're buying airplanes, we're buying tanks, because that's kind of how, kind of, kind of what we know how to do. Um, so that's, that's not a positive thing by any means, but that is, is another reason for the increased focus on commercial science and technology and research and development work that's going on. With regard to DARPA, interestingly enough, I uh, was on the phone last week with one of the PMs who is looking at a, a program managers, who is looking at a, uh, a program that would use uh, advanced general AI in um, command and control systems. Utterly fascinating. Uh, 
And so uh, it's still in the very nascent stages, but it's something that I had experimented with 20 years ago inside the Marine Corps and scared the children so bad that we didn't go back to it because the agents that they were developing at the time in 99, 2000 were very, very nascent algorithmic agents, but it was not difficult in the command centers that I was setting up, which had 50, 60 people in them, big science and or modeling and simulation run thing. It wasn't difficult to see where this was going to go, to see how quickly the agents were able to give my staff and myself options, whether they were planning options or looking at us to determine how we were making decisions, what the enemy was doing. It was really in, at the very nascent stages. So those are just two quick observations on, on, on what you just said. And the technology, the budget piece requires constant management and leadership by somebody to protect that that part of the budget. Uh, DARPA has been relatively successful at keeping its its little slice of the pie, but it, it becomes more difficult as uh, as the budget comes down. So, um, any rate, Jamie, you were going to address a question to Margaret. Yeah, no, I just think one of the uh, sort of the an interesting theme for us to discuss is to what degree there's um, there's strong support. Uh, for these collaborations. You know, in World War II, there was really no hesitancy. There was some regret of scientists who felt that they shouldn't have been involved in, let's say, the Manhattan Project or, or even the Smart Fuse, but very little. Um, and you know, there's one person who worked on the fuse, he says in 1940, uh, all of my colleagues had the same feeling. The America First idea had no, had no support among the scientists, that is, the isolationist idea. Uh, and, and you could even argue I, very quite persuasively that the OSRD was initiated by scientists, that their duty to the national defense, they took uh, upon themselves as a responsibility. And one of the interesting stories, and Margaret, maybe you can, maybe this would be something to talk about, is you know, it, this idea of responsibility r almost feels like it runs into the story that Silicon Valley likes to tell about itself. Mm -hmm. Silicon Valley has an idea that it's, it's independent and that you, you've shown that actually it is quite dependent. And, and maybe there's something that's interesting about these two stories and how they're conflicting now. Um, I don't know. Yeah, I think it's really, I mean, we forget that in 1940, that isolationist sentiment um, encapsulated by the the, the America, what was called the America First movement, was not some fringy thing. It was actually very deeply embedded, very mainstream, had been something that had been in, in part of American politics for four decades, um, mm -hmm. and, and or more, <laughs> and um, and and that the scientists in kind of pushing that were going, you know, being internationalist was some, to some degree going against the grain. And what's extraordinary is the, and again, I think leadership plays a, plays a difference um, here, the degree to which um, Roosevelt and others um, in the sort of leadership of the United States um, kind of pushed public sentiment um, in a different direction in a, in a rapid amount of time. I, I think this question of mission is really important, Jamie. I think you have... You know, what I found so interesting in the kind of early generation, the Cold War generation, Silicon Valley entrepreneurs, people of the 50s and 60s and into the 70s, um, people like, for example, Bob Noyce, co-founder of Intel is one example of, of that. Uh, people like um, Dave Packard of Hewlett Packard, they were they were not um, gung-ho big government types. <laughs> in fact, Packard, you know, was, you know, Packard was a, was a lifelong Republican, um, very politically engaged, um, but was also a very much a small government Republican. He, he gave, was giving, you know, speeches at the Palo Alto Rotary Club in the 60s that were talking about how the Kennedy and Johnson administrations were, you know, bringing socialism to the United States in the form of the Great Society. Like he was, you know, he was no, um, he had his political opinions, but when it came to, you know, the, the project, the Cold War project and the feeling like we need to, this is important for us to do for the country, for the net, for national security, for the national defense. They were un, there was no ambiguity about their position. Like even, even these business leaders who were entrepreneurs, who were not fans of government bureaucracy in any way, um, were like, this is what we got to do. And, and now the politics are, are more complicated. Um, and, and also, you know, it's not the Cold War anymore. I mean, going back to what Bob mentioned about China, 
we talk about, you know, the new Cold War with China. Um, it, there are, you know, once again, it is kind of a bipolar politi- geopolitical conflict. It's an economic one. And it's one, I think, on the tech side is it's just distinct from, say, remember, you know, back in the Cold War, the Soviet Union and the Eastern Bloc built an entirely separate computer system, like computer software and hardware <laughs> behind the Iron Curtain was entirely different and separate from, from that built in the United States and other parts of, of the so-called free world. Now you have, you know, here I am, you know, here's my iPhone assembled in Shenzhen. Here's, um, you know, here's, we have these, you know, 5G, all of these technologies are totally interrelated supply chains that are totally interrelated. And I think that is another thing that makes this question of whose side are you on and America first or the world first or kind of, it is not a, it's not an easy it's, it, it makes it a more complicated for, I think, for scientists and technologists and all of us to figure out, you know, what's the right stance to have. Well, it also seems to me that it, it muddies the waters on, the, uh, on this issue of uh, the, the moral trepidation that some folks have about supporting the department or not. And Jamie, at the very end of your book, you, you, uh, you bring out an, uh, a, a, an interesting um, anecdote there where you talk about the, there's a conversation between two folks about the fuse and the scientist I, and I can't remember the exact names or details Christmas I think was his name talking about how the you know he was not uh, he was having second thoughts about the development of the fuse etc cetera, etc cetera. and as you if I recall as you finish the book he's in a conversation with a survivor of the Battle of Bulls with an army who saw the world very very differently and saw what that fuse did to, to literally save American lives and, and help in that battle. But I think as, as Margaret points out, that, uh, that binary distinction is not something that we are uh, fortunate enough <laughs> for whatever reason to have today. That is much messier and it's much more intertwined. And we see that uh, particularly in the roles of uh, of artificial intelligence. It's one of the, it's kind of one of these most talked about, least understood things inside government. Um, and we constantly confuse in the conversation, different types of AI and what they could or couldn't, you know, and, but everybody is trying to find this, uh, trying to find the answer to, well, how do we morally deal with this? And we've, we, the conversations we've had with regards to all of this technology and, and even in the Valley that Margaret, the things you, you mentioned, you know, people in certain companies say, well, we don't want to work for the government. We think that's morally wrong. And, you know, and, and Jamie, with the examples that you gave in there, you know, even, I mean, the, the, the bomb didn't really become the big public moral issue until after we had, uh, we had dropped it. Um, so I, I, I don't know. I mean, as we, you all have some thoughts on how, is there something that, for example, is there something that science can do to uh, inform this conversation in a way that might be useful as opposed to metaphysicians that might want to inform the conversation? Um, yeah, I think it's a great question. Um, I mean, you, it becomes clear um, if you look at you know, the kinds of uh, weapons that they were developing and, and thinking about developing, it, it's, it's not really the choice of like, would we like to do this? That's not the question. It's, it's, this is probably happening somewhere else. So we better be ready for it. Um, in that context, uh, it, it's sort of, I mean, there's an amazing um, quote, which I didn't put in the book, in which uh, one of Bush's researchers quits on moral grounds. And Bush writes him this uh, remarkable letter in which he says, um, I think your position is untenable. If you could get you know, the access scientists to quit too, you would have a strong position. But you, really what you're suggesting is that we let other countries' scientists contribute to the national defense and our scientists will do nothing and they'll run over us and you know, my son is at war and they'll, I'll leave my son unprotected. And he says, you may be able to join Gandhi in such a point of view, but I am not. <laughs> uh, so that's sort of my, my takeaway is, is that um, 
this isn't this isn't a, a, a you know a moral position on on cooperation isn't shouldn't it can't be a statement on on the world as you wish it as you wish it to be that's a great uh, point, and I think it's it's a uh, I think that the one of the things that's uh, you know an imperative for this convert this is happening, and so are scientists and technologists going to engage in it? And look, there are a lot of things in the you know past tense. Um, uh, you know, the military industrial complex did not, there, there were a lot of reasons a lot of people turned away from it. Um, it did not, you know, there were many, many, many mistakes um, and, and many tragedies. And so how can we think about a new sort of next generation um, partnership across different sectors? And I think government broadly defined, not just national security, but, but but all parts of government that are thinking about a broader public good and and also bringing scientist voices you know the science the science community and the technology community is much more diverse than it was in the 1940s and 50s mm -hmm. and so how can those voices you know those people those experts and that expertise be taken seriously and weigh in on the great challenges before us that are multiple and demand scientific expertise and organization Hello again. Um, I just want to chime in uh, with some of our audience questions. This, this has been such a great conversation, and this this uh, theme that, that that you were um, you all were were fleshing out right now about the the, <laughs> the attitude of the uh, scientists, the technologists outside of government in terms of their you know what what we what they owe the the national security and the government. Um, that's been a, a a theme of, of several of the questions that we've gotten. And, and one of the, I mean, one of the things that I was thinking about as you were talking too, to keep in mind is that with globalization, things have shifted to the point where it's not entirely clear what the nationality and identity is of these corporations. And, we're, you know, right when World War II comes it's, and the CEO of General Motors, uh, I never know if I'm supposed to pronounce it Knutson or just Knutson, but, you know, he famously goes and works for the administration for a dollar a year or whatever. And, and there's no, there's, there's the, the, the nationality of General Motors is not in question, right? And so, but fast forward to, to today, I mean, on top of all the sort of moral qualms that you might have with polarization, with less of a sense of urgency and, 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 and just the, the different politics, you also have corporations in the technology field that yes, may be doing some work for the government, but the majority of their employees are not Amer you know, are not gonna be American. Um, the, the, the vast, you know, a majority of their revenues are coming from overseas. The CEO of a lot of these Fortune 500 companies, him or herself, might not be American anymore. So that, that relationship is also, you know, I'm not sure that a lot of these corporations necessarily want to wrap themselves around the flag, even though they, they clearly make profits from government contracts. Mm -hmm. But when it's in the limelight, that's just kind of an, an interesting additional wrinkle of how the world has changed. And I just kind of throw that out there and, and you can react or not. Um, but uh, let, me, let me touch, we have one, one viewer is asking, uh, again, on this theme, um, how do you think we can rebound from the war fatigue and the political polarization that has led millennials, uh, many of whom work for the Googles, Facebooks, et cetera, um, you know, lead them so they can p potentially recreate a culture that prioritizes work, prioritizes working with the government on technology. So I don't know who would like to take that. Well, so one of the, 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 the threat, the existential threat to the United States in 1941 or 42 was far more obvious than it, uh, than it is today. I mean, it, it just was, it, it, you didn't, you, you didn't have to, I think, convince people, especially, after watching the way the Japanese were rolling in the Pacific and the way Hitler was uh, was taking over Europe, that there was a problem. And and I think that that the America First movement that uh, Margaret mentioned before uh, was once the attack on Pearl Harbor occurred, you, you see a great decline in the amount of support for that and the country begins to shift. Today, one of the challenges is that the, the threat is not so obvious, I would suggest. And the other part of it is that the threat is also most obvious in channels that are very classified and sensitive. And so you, you, have, a, you have another challenge here, which is, how do you, which is trying to, um, to incentivize the electorate 
and the, the industrial base to do work for the government when you are asking in some cases them just to press the I believe button and not thoroughly indoctrinate them into what the, uh, what the threat is. Now, there's a great uh, uh, thing in Jamie's book here where he points out where one of the folks that's out there, I think it was Van Allen, that's trying to get the Navy to use this fuse technology tells this admiral in very classified, sensitive detail exactly how it works. And he makes a decision on the spot to do that because he feels that if he doesn't, he's not going to have the support of this admiral and he's not going to be able to, to implement the fuse. So, and we see that that successfully works, right? So that I think is part of it. The other piece of it is that we, the, the Googles and Microsofts and Amazons, and again, I'm looking at this from, from a hundred thousand feet here, in many cases uh, behave as if they were nation states. And yet we deal with them as if they were wholly owned subsidiaries of the United States and that they ought to do this for us because their headquarters is in Washington state or in California. When in fact, as you mentioned, many of their employees are not, and in many cases, the employees feel more loyalty to that company than they do to any particular country. And so um, this is a, you know, trying to unravel this Gordian knot is, is going to be, uh, it's going to be very difficult, but I think it starts with uh, an understanding that there is a threat and the threat is here and here's what it's doing. And, and I'll leave you just with one last thing. It's become more evident in the last couple of years, exactly the extent to which the Chinese had been stealing intellectual property and infiltrating the US defense industry and other parts of the United States that had been, um, than had been publicly known prior to that. And you see that once that gets out there, that there begins to be more of an understanding that, okay, so these economies are intertwined, everything's intertwined, but we still have a problem here that we can't, we, that we can no longer ignore. And to think that because they're intertwined means that there's not going to be a conflict has been disproven many times over. And if I'm not mistaken, 1910, 1911, the best-selling book in Europe was called The End of War. And, uh, and it was based on the premise that the countries at the time were so intertwined economically, they'd never go to war again, right? Three years later, <laughs> killing hundreds of thousands of each other on, in the psalm. So, uh, Anyway, that's just kind of my perspective on that. I want to also turn to a question from Jeffrey Alexander, um, who asks, uh, this is interesting, historically, a huge impact of defense on US science was DOD funding of graduate student research training. That funding has declined in recent years. Has this affected how national defense contributes to US innovation capacity? And is anyone worried about that decline? I'm worried. <laughs> I mean, one of the things that makes, so there are two things that made the, helped make the American research complex broadly defined the juggernaut that it has been. Like, why is the U.S., why is the U.S. overwhelming leader in the tech space? Um, one is investment in higher education, um, public investment at the federal and at the state level, making higher education, ex, you know, world-class higher education affordable and accessible, you know, going to University of California for $50 a semester, <laughs> um, uh, and, and also um, making opening doors to the best and the brightest from around the world to come here to study and to, in many cases, stay on and start companies. And those, you know, the, the Americans do not have a monopoly on techno technological talent. The reason that the U.S. has been such a powerhouse has, beca has been because of immigration policy, foreign, foreign educational exchange, and um, an investment in higher ed. And those things have been disinvested in and, and a chill has, you know, international, coming here to study, if you're an international student, has become not only more difficult, but there have been a lot of reasons that you might be like, oh, I think I'm going to stay in Bangalore. Why would I come here? And that is a, you know, that's an own goal on the U.S. Those are things are, those are, I mean, I looking at this historically, those are foundational to not only kind of 
making, you know, creating opportunities for individuals to reach their full potential and have, you know, do the things they do. They, you know, the founding generation of the Valley, these guys who come there in the 50s and 60s, they didn't come from money. They didn't, you know, they ended up in Northern California partially because they didn't, you know, didn't have a father who was a partner in a bank or a law firm. You know, they didn't, they didn't, they were just smart engineers. And these incredible opportunities came their way, courtesy in large part because of public funding. I, first of all, I really appreciate the soccer reference. Um, and I'm really <laughs> glad you, you brought up because that certainly is, is part of the part of the story here. Um, here's a fun question, uh, an anonymous attendee. We have a lot of anonymous people on this, uh, on this webinar, um, a lot of dodgy people. No. Uh, so is asking, there's a commonly held belief that while the brightest scientific and technical minds of previous generations were working on projects like Section T, that had critical history defining importance. Today, they are largely working on commercial apps um, and offer forms of more frivolous tech drawn by huge salaries that government can't match and perhaps dissuaded from working for the government because of the larger tech backlash. Is there any truth to this belief? And if so, what can we do to change that? Well, I, I don't know if the what I would suggest is that if you look at the amount of spending money that we're spending on s and and research and development that the government spends on, as opposed to where we were 25 years ago and the percentage of that that's being done by the commercial sector now, uh, that would be a starting place to try to understand why there's much more of an attraction to do that. They in this day and age in the, in the government, especially in some of the, uh, the um, uh, agencies that do things that have direct applicability into the commercial side, the folks that come there and stay there do it for the mission. It's not the money. I mean, they, they could make three or four times that amount of money if they decided to go do this commercially, but they do it because they feel like they're making a difference to the, to the country and to the mission of national security. That whether you can rely on a segment of the population to always feel that way without any for other incentives is probably naive. And so, you know, we have to find a way to do that. I, when I was on active duty, I was suggesting that we would give young enlisted net operators bonuses like we give pilots. You know, so like, look, we're giving pilots bonuses and, and there's a skill set that's probably declining in its relevance and yet the skill set that's increasing in its relevance we don't incentivize them at all so you know these kids get out after six years and they got you know google's beating and beating the door or beating them to the door and uh, offering them three times that amount of money and stable home life and no deployments and so it's it's difficult there i mean there's just some real blocking and tackling kind of things personnel related that, that we need to address it's not hard it just takes political will yeah, and, and I would just add, this was one of the central questions about organizing science uh, after the war for, for defense. I mean, in 1941, you already had 52% of the top chemists in the country working for OSRD. You had nearly 80% of the physicists. And, and one of the questions after the war was, these were scientists who had put aside their research interests. Mm -hmm. uh, so they weren't, you know, they, in many cases, in some cases, they were sort of out of touch with their field by the end of the war. They were working on other projects. Um, so you're right, there, these are all, it was a great answer. I mean, all of these incentive problems that you have, like, do I get to publish? Uh, what, what mm -hmm. kind of rewards do I have? Can we get 20% of their time? Um, these are all, all, all important questions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we still have quite a few questions, but um, mindful of the time, I think we're, we're almost ready to wrap up. I do want to turn back to Jamie. This question um, that I just read, references section T, a couple of others did. And this conversation has been so meaty and started off really honing in on, on the, the sort of the big structural thematic questions that I feel like maybe we should end, Jamie, with giving you an opportunity to bring out, you know, um, sh show the spotlight onto the proximity fuse and, and, and just tease out a little bit the, uh, just the narrative here so that people, if they haven't already read your book, go rush out and buy it. Just tell us a little bit about what, you know, we've referenced the proximity fuse, but what was it? What, what really happened? Thanks, Andreas. I appreciate it. Um, yeah, so there, I tell the broader story of science, um, mobilizing science to the war, but a lot of the book focuses on uh, 
this small band of inventors, uh, experimental physicists, and then later became sort of a motley group of you know, like radio amateurs and even like oil men from Texas and anybody who knew anything about radios. Um, but it's about um, creating what was called the world's first smart weapon, which was a better way to shoot down airplanes. Um, at the beginning of the war, in the early weeks of the Blitz, the ratio of down sh of shells that it took down to shoot one airplane was 20,000 to one. This was measured in something called RPB rounds per bird. Uh, so we were really bad at shooting down airplanes at the start of the war. And an American uh, physicist said, at the start of the war, it would be a sheer stroke of luck to hit anything. Um, so the Navy realizes that their battleships are vulnerable and says, um, you know, the, the problem was we had these shells, these are explosive shells, and you shoot them at an airplane and they have shrapnel and they're supposed to explode in the flight path. But you had to put the timer on the shells to 1 40th of a second. It had to explode at a 1 40th of a second window. It's going 2,000 feet a second and it's rotating over 250 times a second. So even if you were a foot off in your aim, if you're a second off in, in the timing device, you're 2,000 feet away from the aircraft. So everyone knew, like, the, the idea was easy. Well, what if we could put some kind of electronic sensor inside of a shell? It could sense automatically that an airplane was near and blow up in proximity to the aircraft. Uh, the problem was the electronics of the day were very, very sensitive. The transistor didn't exist yet. Instead of the transistor, they had these little things called vacuum tubes, these little glass devices. They could, you can see for scale, there's a pen. Um, and they had to withstand these extraordinary pressures inside an anti-aircraft gun, 20,000 times the force of gravity. Uh, for reference, um, a space shuttle that launches three times the force of gravity. So really it was this engineering puzzle of how do we get these very delicate electronics to withstand these extreme forces. Um, and it's this uh, you know, story of how they did it and they had little support at the beginning and they, they sort of didn't know what they were doing and they buy the wrong blasting powder and then eventually they get good Navy liaison and, and they succeed. Um, but it's, it's really just a story of, of cooperation and overcoming uh, scientific puzzles under great pressure um, and organization. Awesome. Thank you. It's, it's, really, it's really a fun read. And this has been a really fun conversation. Um, Margaret, General, Jamie, thank you so much. I wish we, could, uh, I wish we had another hour, but maybe we can do it again sometime. Um, so it's a theme that is is timeless, and yet um, you tell it through this great story of um, of the wartime uh, needs. And and Margaret, I really also enjoyed your your book as well um, on the, the birth of Silicon Valley. I, I, I first heard you in conversation with Kara Swisher, which is how you you came up on my radar, and I was like, how have I not read this book? <laughs> it's, it's fantastic, and it's and now out in paperback. There you go, and it and it animates so much of what we we like to think about and, and are engaged with the future tense. And, and, and obviously, uh, it's very central to the inquiries of, of our colleagues at Issues. Um, uh, also, I should plug this Friday at noon, Future Tense is having a, an event unpacking the, the TikTok, WeChat, uh, drama, quagmire, whatever we want to refer to it as. And it's, we're posing the question of whether it is a, uh, a win for national security or a loss for free speech. We have some great speakers in that. So noon Eastern, uh, nine Pacific Friday. Um, you can follow us at Future Tense now. Um, and if you want more information, you want to register for that event Friday, um, you can go to the New America website, newamerica.org and, and click on events. Um, then next Wednesday at our sort of normal rhythm of, of a point of time of, of Wednesdays at noon, we are having another free speech project event looking at uh, the balkanization of the internet and, and how we might have gone from having one internet to various internets. And that's going to star our Slate colleague, Josh Keating, and New America's president and C I mean, CEO, Anne Marie Slaughter, and others. So thank you so much for coming today. And please continue to follow us. And thanks to you three for a great conversation. <laughs>